kid again. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. Oh my god, that's fucked up. Ooh, that's that's fucked up. Hello and welcome to another episode of How Fucked Up is Fucked Up. This is a series that runs on the concept of how fucked up fucked up is. We share with you the facts of the fucked up. On today's episode of How Fucked Up is Fucked Up, we take a look at tourism. Fucked up places that you can visit. I'm your host, Haley. Today I'm joined by Yara. Yara, how are you today? I'm good. Cheers. I'm happy to have you back. I'm excited to get through tourism with you. Let me just give you some history, Yara. You're going to love it. All right. Tourism became popular 17th century. And that's actually a little bit of bullshit because it didn't really become popular so much as just people were like starting to travel a little bit more rather than just being like, I'm going to settle here for the rest of my life. 1600s, transportation was starting to be a bit more organized. Stagecoaches were running between major English towns, but they were expensive, uncomfortable, and they traveled on rough roads. In the 1800s, traveling by train was introduced. The first steam train that was built in 1804. People were worried that the speed would make the rail passengers unable to breathe and be shaken unconscious. Cause people just like didn't know that we could go this fast. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wow. <laughs> the 1900s, ships and luxurious voyages. I don't know if it was really yet considered tourism, but people were like, if I got money, I'm gonna go on a, a boat. Titanic days. <gasps> yeah. Between the 1920s and the 1930s, that's between the two big wars, right? So this was now considered the golden age of flight. It was the golden age of flight because people were doing races, record-setting flight time. So like they were more testing the, the bounds of what we can do with the plane. Then in the 50s, it became, I think, a little bit more safe and a little more common. So that's when it became more about business and leisure, smoking cigarettes on the plane. All the air flight attendants were like models, yep. drugs, alcohol. Mile high club. Mile high club. This is where tourism was starting to really kick in because even today, like now we all travel because you want to see these amazing sites around the world and it's like easy like can you believe it's like like 70 years ago that this became popular yeah crazy. i went to italy for pizza and i came back <laughs> that's crazy we have been missing out on a lot of tourism options right now because of covid but we are looking forward to many more and we are going to give the people just that millions of people around the world to their cities and towns boosting their economy in any area that can declare that they have a tourist attraction for example, people travel far and wide to see Kelowna Mediterranean and Luca Malta photo. And then Newton <laughs> after William Blake in London, England photo. Photo. Niagara Falls where the Canada and the US border meet. Photo. So many more amazing places that we want to travel to. But on today's episode, we are going to be sharing with you some of the most fucked up places that we could find that are considered a tourist attraction. I'm are excited. You... I'm excited. Let's see. Oh. How fucked up is fucked up? <laughs> How fucked up can it get? First on our list of fucked up tourist attractions that you can go visit is in West Virginia. It's Very called... touristy. What is that? Yeah, I know. West Virginia. Who goes to West Virginia? Well, people go there because there's a tale of a man called the Mothman. The Mothman? <laughs> the <what>? Mothman? <laughs> the Mothman! He lives on Drury Lane. No, that's just the gingerbread man. I made a little rhyme. Can I sing you my rhyme that I of made about? Of course. Okay. okay. It is. In West Virginia, he was born and raised in the forest. Yeah, he spent most of his days chilling out, relaxing, and relaxing out cool. He was chasing some teens who were out skipping school. It's so good. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> in this town called Point Pleasant. And this Mothman creature was reported from some teens who skipped school or something. They were partying and then they saw this crazy guy and he had big red eyes and like had wings and skinny Maybe legs. he was high too. <laughs> yeah, who knows, right? You think these kids must have been high. Okay, first of all, I mean, a moth, it's, it's just like a tiny, 
And it's not tiny, but it's a small creature. You know? I found of all the scary things in the world. So this was around 1966, but then the, there was more accounts of this. Like a lot of people in that town were kind of saying, yeah, like I saw the Mothman. I saw the big red eyes. I saw him try to steal my baby. Like people were like totally consumed by this. Now there hasn't been any recent sightings, you know, but what's really interesting is what the town has done with this Mothman creature. Such a scary, haunted thing. They decided to have some fun with it. 50 years later, they still have all these amazing things that you can go check out. So if you go to West Virginia, make sure you stop by the Mothman Museum. He has an actual museum. He's got the museum. Wow. Imagine it's just some random guy wearing like random costume and now he's like the song's hero or something like they've got bakeries that sell Mothman cookies. They've got they've got a Mothman statue. Mothman's got like an eight pack. And then to top it all off, to keep this tradition alive and to keep the tourist attraction alive by having a Mothman festival. Yeah, that's insane. Look at the people. They're so happy. <laughs> I know. I bless the their souls. Wow. That's total small town vibes. Like, I come from a small town. Uh, <laughs> I love it. They turn it into a holiday. It's like as if it were Santa, but a little bit creepier. Are they scared? Yeah. I mean, what if this thing is real? Like? <laughs> well, uh, it's never really hurt anyone or killed anyone. So the story goes. All right. But are you ready for our next one? Yes, let's go. Let's just say it's really fucking gross. This why it's fucked up. It's California, cool. but Obispo. <gasps> Obispo. So this is called Bubblegum Alley. <laughs> it doesn't sound bubblegum. Looks like a piece of art, right? It's like bright, it's colorful, but when you take a closer look, it is actually just thousands and thousands of chewed up pieces of gum stuck onto a wall. Those look like condoms. 15 foot high by 70 foot long alleyway. It's like completely filled with gums. Like people who go and put gum now are putting gum on top of gum. What's this kid doing so close to the wall? Ew, people don't touch it. I hate oh. bubble gum. I hate eating bubble gum. I hate anything that has to do with bubble gum. I hate it. And now you're showing me a wall, an alley. <laughs> I hate people that chew bubble gum loudly. Uh -huh. and Oh, I don't know. Yara doesn't me. like bubble gum. So if anyone's yeah. trying to date Yara, do not get her bubble gum for her birthday. No, yeah. She will not be no. happy. <laughs> this reminds me of is remember an elf? Do you ever see Elf with Will? Yes, Farrell? yes. And he's of walking course, down yes. the street and he's like, free candy. Imagine if you walk down that alleyway. Yeah, and on those walls with like the locks, you know, like in Paris, you know, the love yeah, locks and whatever. Cute. That's cool. But bubble gum, like, why? I'm glad you asked that question, Yara. So the origin isn't exactly clear, but what I found funny was that when I was searching it, it this document said, some historians believe. What a historian is talking about dried up bubble gum. They do say that it started after World War II in St. Louis, Obispo. It was a high school graduating class event. Or maybe it started in the 1950s as a rivalry between St. Louis Obispo High School in California Polytechnic State University. It sounds like it started from students. But you're telling me it's, there's been gum there since like the 50s. So that's like 70 uh, years ago. Yeah. And yeah. it's still stuck there. Here we go, 1970s. And some shop owners were like not having it. I wonder why they had the alleyway undergo severe cleaning. <laughs> the gum graffiti survives. Um, and then since then, they, they haven't even tried. On this bright side, it's an attraction. That's I'm not gonna lie, like, if I'm in California or somewhere around the area, you would check I, it I out. would go check it out. I yeah. would be taking like my, my selfie photos with no. it. You're like, ah! From far away, right outside the alley, but no. I, yeah. I don't even go in. <laughs> well, I'm happy we uh, got through that one. On to our next one. Are you ready for the next? Okay, absolutely. Totally Yara, our type of vacation. It's called the Unisun Spa Resort in Japan. At first glance, it looks like a normal resort. Okay. Bad. It's not. <laughs> if you take a closer look, the coolest thing about this place, total tourist attraction for its baths. Okay, yeah, I can do that, yes. What about these baths, Yara? 
is that they are flavored. I like that. First, super detoxing. It's called the green tea bath. Matcha everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be detoxing and relaxing. Green tea's supposed to be so good for your skin. You yeah. come out of there feeling a whole other level. Oh, I want to do that. Followed by the coffee bath. I get a little shaky if I have too much coffee. So like, I don't know if I'd just be sitting there like, this is so <laughs> relaxing, <laughs> but then it gets better. <laughs> it gets much, much better. They have sake baths. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> I thought you would. It's sake bomb and you just jump in. <laughs> Everyone's like, that's not how you do it. When you drink sake, doesn't your whole body feel like it's the oh, inside God. of a bath? Go mm -hmm. into a bath, and I think you're allowed to drink because from the photos I see, everyone looks plastered. And that you're bathing in that, then then you're drinking it. It's kind of nasty. I don't think you drink it from <laughs> the bath. No, you don't do that here. You don't do that. Not a sacky girl, which I don't know who isn't. I'm sure you'll be with us on this one. It <laughs> is called the red wine bath. That's a, that's like a dream come true. Bath and alcohol and then they put them together in a way that I never would have imagined. It's just opened my eyes to a whole new way of life. Just loving like the decor. They have the bottle, they've got like people splashing around. You know how when you get married you go on a honeymoon? This is where you go. This is when you go divorced. Exactly. We're going to Japan to get me in a wine bath. Don't yeah. take me home until I can't stand. Do you feel leaving refreshed or fucked up? I yeah. think that's the point when you get out of there and you're like, mm, I can't do anything anymore. Whether it's because you're so, re so relaxed or because you're so fucked up. Because it's that. fucked up doesn't mean it has to be bad. This is really good fucked up. Like you go there, you get fucked up. The question though, is it, does it only come in red? Do, the, do they have like white wine, like rosé, like champagne, you know, like sparkly? What if they have like a vodka one? I mean, it's not a bar, Yara. I'm gonna get photos from Yara tomorrow in her bath with like pouring bottles of alcohol in her bath. <laughs> I'm in me a mojito. <laughs> I'm actually drinking one. <laughs> are, are you ready for a final fucked up? Absolutely. This one's fucked up and I know that you know it because you've been there. The thing is, is when we say fucked up, it might be fucked up in a weird way for us, but it might be in the normal for other people, right? It might not be fucked up at all. Exactly. The last on our list here, the Bangkok Penis Shrine or the Chow Mei Tub Tin. In Thailand, they have a whole bunch of sculptures called the phallus, which is another fancy word for the penis. And it's on this specific island and it's got all sizes you can imagine but what it really is is it's a symbol of good luck and it's a symbol of fertility so yara you've actually been here and i just want to know what your experience was and what it was like i remember this um we went to this beach it's on it's in krabi okay so anyways you go there and there's a lot of activities to do and whatever it's supposed to be a private beach where it was full of people so people are chilling on one side, and then you look on the other end, and there's this cave. You go closer, and all you see are, like, huge penises, basically. And they're made of everything, every material you can imagine. So there's metal ones, there's wooden ones, there's, like, plastic. What happens when, if you're a man, and you go there, and you're, like, looking for one that looks like yours, and you're like, no, 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 my size. <laughs> Some of them are smaller. Some of them are, oh, some of them are actual size. Some are big, some are small, some are fat, some are skinny, you know, <laughs> all shapes and sizes. We asked around and it turns out it's a huge thing over there where they, they celebrate fertility. And it's related to a specific goddess, a goddess of fertility, of people who are having difficulties conceiving. They go, they pray for her so that they can have children. And you find this everywhere in Thailand. And I just find it very interesting because it's, completely normal you know it's not like it's something shameful or anything at all we might be different here but we should open up a little bit and be a little bit more comfortable with our genitalia and just mm -hmm. celebrate the shit out of it naked Even part is, is that phallic architecture has been around for centuries a deliberate penis admiration the worship of the phallus has existed since the stone age 
in the Neolithic period and the Bronze Age. In ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, genitalia and the human sexuality received a high degree of attention. The ancient Greeks honored the phallus. They celebrated phallic festivals. The Greek Roman Priapus was known as the god of fertility. He was depicted with a giant phallus and public architectural pieces. <laughs> Well endowed gentleman, like a <laughs> kickstand he's got on him. He could be a short man because that goes through his kneecaps. <laughs> like, hey. That, that's like a third leg, like, no. Feminists have pointed out the symbolic nature of phallic architecture has really taken over the world. And I'm, I'm total feminism. Equality, I mean, fuck equality. I think we should get it all. Feminists. So men and women have stood up for this and said that they're putting men on a pedestal and they're making it all about the men and their, their junk does all of the work. And so what they're really saying is like everything, if you look at skyscrapers, everything is in the shape of a yeah, penis, yeah, but where are the vagina? Where are the boobs? So women are like, stop building everything in the shape of dicks. Why are there no vagina-shaped skyscrapers? I mean, when you look at it like that, a skyscraper is a rectangle. I've never seen a rectangle penis, but there are some things that are a little bit more obviously towards men. I don't see any statues of women with their vagina just hanging out. Even Where's the naked female it, thinker? Exactly. It also reminds me of that, uh, that movie Superbad where the boy has an obsession with drawing penises. The what? kid is like 10 years old and he's, he's trying to hide and then this mean girl comes and dumps his lunchbox and he's like known as the kid, the weird kid who draws a bunch of dicks. Honestly, I'm really not, I think all guys have an obsession with that. Have you seen your history book? Was yours covered yes! with- Yeah! Remember here in Montreal, you know, when you have a big snowstorm and then walking on the street, you always have penises drawn on like cars or on the street or whatever. And it's like, why isn't it a vagina? Like, why See, I think the vagina yeah. needs a logo. Just like, I the thing is too. about the penis, it's so easy to draw. It's just, it's not yeah. as easy to draw. I, I mean, I, I have to be honest, I've drawn my fair share of dicks. Go around Montreal and just, you know, oh my God, in snow. I'm making like snowmen. We'll do snow vaginas. No one's gonna know what it is. Snow vaginas. <laughs> what is that? Our conclusion. Tourism is awesome. And we are all dying to get back out there yes. and travel the world. You never know what's gonna be the next tourist attraction. If you, if you got something crazy in your hometown, if you feel like dressing up like a bug and scaring the shit out of some people, that might make your town the next tourist attraction. Yep. But uh, thank you guys for joining us today on another episode of How Fucked Up is fucked up. What's really interesting is what the town has done. Ever. Look what he sent me. Did you do that? Is it like? A dude? Oh, it's Jackie Chan. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm wearing the same thing as Jackie Chan. Like Cause that's it.